Uh, I'm Louise Bazina. I'm the Artistic Director of Brisbane Festival. And before we kick off our little chat this morning, <laughs> uh, I'd just like to um, take a moment to uh, pay my respects uh, to um, the, the elders, the the traditional owners of this country, that this is Turrbal country and Yuggera country across uh, the Maywa, uh, and just to pay respects to those that continue to guide us across this festival uh, and all the work that we do and have been doing uh, and to uh, all the First Nations artists uh, and Torres Strait Islander artists who are here with us today. So thank you very much. Uh, this is really wonderful, a uh, really great privilege to be here and have this conversation with you this morning. Uh, and of course, uh, the the star is Maxine Doyle, who I'm going to be having a chat with, but we'll be hearing mostly from Max. Uh, so Max, before I start launching, we feel like we're on a breakfast TV show. <laughs> Well, we're going to start our own version of one. Um, but before I start to uh, ask you some questions, uh, I'm just going to read out Maxine's bio just to set some context and, and um, talk about her extraordinary career to date. So just bear with me because it's a pretty impressive CV, obviously. So since 2002, Maxine has been director and choreographer for Punch Drunk, uh, with whom she co-directed the um, multi-award winning Sleep No War, More, which is uh, in repertoire still in New York City uh, and in many other cities, uh, London as well, Shanghai, The Drowned Man, uh, The House Where Winter Lives, The Fireball Faust, Mask of the Red Death, Tunnel uh, 228, and uh, her recent work that is still playing in London, uh, The Burnt City, which is an extraordinary production as well. Uh, Maxine has done an enormous amount of work in theatre and opera, including The Cunning Little Vixen, uh, Evening at the Talk House for the National Theatre and Electra for the Old Vic. Uh, in 2022, Maxine premiered and staged an installation work, Here Not Here, uh, in collaboration with artist Es Devlin uh, for uh, Gothenburg Opera dance company in Sweden. Uh, she has created many dance theatre works for Ballet Boys, the Martha Graham Company in, in, the, in the US, uh, collaborations with Bobby Jean Smith, Verve, uh, in 2019, and this is quite an important part of the story because it's how we met, but we'll come to that. Uh, this was your first Australian work, uh, Sunset? Yeah. In 2019, uh, Maxine was the creator of Sunset for the Perth uh, Festival uh, and she was brought to Australia from, uh, with Strut Dance Company uh, and made an exquisite piece where you met some Australian collaborators that have continued on your journey. Uh, Maxine is a regular principal artist at Springboard Dance Montreal uh, and has mentored many uh, amazing artists. Uh, and in 2023, Maxine made her Brisbane premiere uh, with, of course, Salamander. Uh, so, you know, a very impressive CV, but we had a brief chat this morning and, of course, just thinking about the context of this forum, uh, I think you said, Max, um, you know, you're the epitome of an independent artist. And, and whilst there's a lot of company, um, companies that I've mentioned, very, you know, extraordinary, accomplished companies, Max is foremost an independent artist. So I am going to bring a bit of that lens, I hope, um, which is useful to everybody here uh, to understand and to have a, a further uh, learning from, from Maxine and her career as an independent artist. But before we get to that, how does it all begin? So I'm just curious, Maxine, um, tell us about the 15-year-old Maxine Doyle. Uh, I, you know, I've read all about the influences, Pina Bausch, for example, but if you're happy to launch straight in and, and tell us a little bit about, you know, the, the teenage Maxine Doyle. Uh, yeah. Um, hello, everyone. So it's very nice to be here uh, today. Um, yeah, so um, I actually started dancing, I discovered dance in my secondary school when I was 12. I didn't, 
I didn't come from a, an artistic family particularly, um, and well, that's a, a, lo a lovely family, but I, we didn't, we weren't particularly arty. And I, in my secondary school, I, um, I was walking past, first year of my secondary school, I was walking past the sort of school hall one day, and there was these, um, there was all this like great dancing, moving stuff going on in the hall, and I'd never really seen anything like it before. Um, and then I, I realized um, it was dance club. And I was like, oh, that looks cool. Um, so I, and you had to audition to go to dance club. So I auditioned for dance club. And of course I didn't get in because I'd never, I'd never danced a step and was falling over my feet and I couldn't touch my toes. Um, so I was, but I was disappointed, but I was, it, it interested me. It set up a sort of curiosity. So then I, I, I went to, uh, I discovered that I wasn't too bad at gymnastics. I wasn't very good at it, but I wasn't too bad at it. I went and did a little bit of rhythmical gymnastics and I practiced my stretches every night in my bedroom for 45 minutes. And then the next audition came around for dance club um, and I got into dance club. And then that was it. Um, Elaine Overton Spears was my teacher and she just, uh, she just opened a whole world of um, jazz, modern and, and contemp contemporary dance. And this was sort of in the 80s. So 15 year old Maxine was um, dancing at school um, I think I did my first ballet class when I was 15 and I went to the local ballet school um, down the road and they said, yeah, you can come in, but you have to start at the bottom. So you have to start with the five-year-olds. So there was 15-year-old me and the five-year-olds doing, doing ballet, which again, I wasn't very good at, but I did it for a few years. Um, and I was just doing lots of dancing at school and actually pretty much from as soon as I started dancing, I, I, I fell in love with moving. I fell in love with how that made me feel. I fell in love with the sort of the freedom and the expression of it. Um, but at the same time, I also, I, I also wanted to start making things straight away. That was always my drive actually, was always to make things. So I think before I discovered dancing, I was like trying to, you know, writing school plays and things like that. But um, so yeah, so 15 year old Maxine was doing that. Um, watching Fame, it was a time of, it was a time of leg warmers. It was a, it was, a, it was, it was, <laughs> Tough in the in the eighties in Britain. It was Margaret Thatcher. It was a time of strikes, and it was a really angry, uh, politicised country. And I'm from the north of England originally. I'm from Liverpool, um, which was, you know, at that point, a city that the government were kind of trying to ignore, and the Liverpoolians were sort of coming back in force against that. Um, and dance was a real. It was a way out, actually. Uh, I was addicted to fame, the kids from fame, and all that kind of Americanization of dancing. Um, yeah, so that was that was 15-year-old me. Thank you. <laughs> I think it's great to hear how how it all began and and your inspiration and your tenacity and and where it where the early humble beginnings because it all just doesn't happen like that. So here we are in uh, September 2023 in Brisbane. Uh, it feels like a long way from home perhaps. Um, so I just want to talk a bit about how we actually got to this point because uh, this is through um, you know those moments where you you see something that really moves you and then uh, as a festival director or someone in a position who has uh, an ability uh, to um, harness or, or try and entice that to be something for your community uh, was certainly how this began. So uh, I had was just finishing Bleach Festival. There's some, you know, Gold Coasters over there uh, representing, uh, and I was uh, actually not properly in the role of, of artistic director yet at Brisbane Festival. And I, I had heard about uh, Sunset, which of course, um, Strut Dance's com uh, director at the time was you know incredibly passionate about. So I flew over and I saw it and it was uh, exquisite. It was incredibly uh, moving, the storytelling, the choreography, the whole experience of it was um, really profound and something that I felt incredibly attracted to and uh, really wanted to pursue as something for Brisbane. And so um, Max and I had a, a conversation that night uh, and obviously the world was a bit different in 2019 <laughs> uh, and Max kindly agreed to come to Brisbane and begin a journey of potentially making something profound. But the, the kind of key, and, and this is certainly um, important to me, but it was the 
ethos of what was behind Sunset was working with local Australian artists. Uh, and obviously in, in Perth, it was um, Strut. For Brisbane, uh, it was Australasian Dance Collective and acknowledging Amy Hollingsworth here today, the artistic director, uh, who's doing an extraordinary job with her company and she had just started as well. So it just felt like a really important moment in time to elevate Brisbane contemporary dance. Uh, and so a journey began. So Max, I guess with all of that, your first impressions of Australia was Perth and then Brisbane. Can we just talk about what that's been like for you uh, and anything that's really stood out that uh, has been kind of a profound moment in your journey with Australia? Um, I mean, I think, I think firstly, I think I've worked with lots of uh, Australian um, dancers um, in, in, in London um, and in New York and in Shanghai, I think. And um, always found the Australian, the Australian dancers actually, if I'm honest, to, to have a, just an incredible work ethic. Um, they would, they'll always be like the first ones, uh, early, early to class, um, arrive early, do their work, turn up, work hard, do their shows. The Europeans will turn up smoking a cigarette, drinking a can of Coke f five minutes after class is supposed to start. And I... I sort of really, I, I, and that's that. I've, I think I've worked with about forty Australian dancers now, and I think that's that's a consistency that I see throughout throughout them. Um, I think, in, interestingly, just in terms of the kind of independent artist connection. So, um, just to talk a little bit about Sunset and how that came came about, as I've, I've I'd, obviously I work a lot with Punch Drunk, but Punch Drunk is not my company. Punch Drunk is Felix Barrett's company. Um, I am actually a long-term collaborator, um, and it's been an amazing collaboration. But around sort of 2015, I was kind of realizing that my future wasn't necessarily with Punch Drunk. It wasn't my company, and I couldn't take it necessarily in the direction that I wanted. So I kind of started, even though I had a, quite a big body of work, I, I started, you know, it was about hustling again for new opportunities, new collaborations, um, yeah, kind of not starting at the beginning, but but trying to pick up um, more new possibilities. And Paul Selwyn Norton, the director then of, of Strut Dance, which is an organization for independent artists in Perth, um, had a meeting with Punch Drunk to invite Punch Drunk to come to Strut to work with local dancers, essentially local artists, to create a, a, a site-based work. And Punch Drunk um, Felix wasn't interested in, in that. He said, uh, no, that doesn't fit in with with my vision, um, which is which is fine, um, and I was sort of sitting at the meeting, and I was like, "Oh, um, that seems that seems a shame, actually." And I was I just said to Paul, I said, "Well, I'll I I would love to come and um, begin this sort of adventure with strut dance and um, meet some new artists and some new collaborations, discover a country um, that I'm not familiar with." My first in, um, interaction with Australia actually was Darwin in the Northern Territories when I did some traveling. So I wasn't totally new to Australia, but I hadn't been, I hadn't been to Perth. Um, and so that was the beginning of that collaboration. And what I really treasured about that was it, it happened over several year, over a few years. So it was a series of workshops. Um, I think three, I think I, we led three workshops. First workshop was, was, was sort of more dance focused. And then the second workshop was much more multi-arts focused. Um, I think we worked with about 50 artists over a couple of weeks and we worked in the studio, we worked all over the building, we went into, we did a few days on a, in a, an empty sort of secondary school. And I felt like, of course you can't develop that many relationships in a few weeks, but I felt like I developed relationships with, with people um, over time. Um, and at the end of that second workshop, we kind of did a casting for what would be Sunset. Um, Lovely Humphrey, he's just, wait, give us a wave, Humphrey. Yeah, I haven't seen Humphrey in several years, but Humphrey was on it, it was uh, the kind of leading actor and sort of leading light in the sunset process. Um, and I'm, I think it was, it was also my first, sunset was a site specific work that took place in a, an old, what was a, a homeless hostel um, for young men that then became a, a, ho um, a hospital um, on the Swan River in Perth in a very kind of, wealthy area of Dalkeith. It was this kind of amazing, amazing site that had been closed sort of since the 90s. Um, 
but it was my my first independent project making a work on a, on a site and I hadn't actually made a site specific work before Punch Drunk's work is not site specific um, it's epic in scale but we tend to transform buildings and tell and make them a blank canvas really for the, the, the stories that we want to tell or the vehicles make them a vehicle for the stories that we want to tell um, so that was a really that was a really sort of pivotal and um, challenging moment how do I how do I engage with Perth how do I engage with this site as a visitor um, what how can I lead a conversation that feels authentic um, that feels honest so that 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 it was a site specific work we drew on the stories as much as we could from um, the people that had lived in Sunset we had one one book uh, which was um, the journal of uh, some memories some recollections that the, the last matron of Sunset had um, I worked with an extraordinary group of artists Humphrey was one of them and we began this real really collaborative journey um, which was about it became an exchange of ideas um, a, a, a level of interrogations and Sunset became a work of fiction it wasn't a, it wasn't a play I was very clear with Paul I said we're not making a play I'm not writing a play it's not a history story it's it's a fiction um, and the building and the stories of the, this building are inspiring this fiction um, so that and I think that the kind of the the that process was was a real shift in my uh, artistic uh, methodology um, and then I think one of the most touching moments of that um, of that show was and what we, we weren't expecting was the, the the range of audience that came to see Sunset so it because we were opening up the building for the first time in many years um, lots of audience who had connections to that site came to the came to see Sunset so that from um, a gentleman that I met who was um, an, an orderly there when he was 19 say just before he went to university to the the woman that was the last matron before the um, before sunset closed its doors so and families uh, grandchildren grandparents so we had a real a really interesting demographic of audience coming um, to that show and that was actually terrif that was both beautiful and both terrifying as well the sort of sense of kind of responsibility can I just pick up on a couple of things that you've said there the exchange of ideas the collaboration being a guest uh, and then how that uh, your spirit of generosity but the spirit of generosity that was then uh you know given back uh through the the local artists that you worked with and you could really see that in the work and i think that that was what really drew me to your work but i also just um this idea of transformation as opposed to um, site specific I, you know there's we talk about site specific work we talk about immersive work we talk about transformational work of spaces but just having that clarity in the way you talked about that was site specific salamander is not site specific it is a transformation of a space uh, immersive is a term we throw around a lot and I, I think if we've got time we should maybe come back to that if that's something that perhaps we're interested in unpacking a little bit more but the series of workshops that got to the point where the casting took place and your interaction with the artists. Um, these are all things that, you know, contributed to the significant outcome of, of Sunset. And so then from that moment, you um, were brought to Brisbane and we went on quite an adventure trying to find a place. At the time, it was going to be, uh, you know, breathing new life was your words. I wanted to, you wanted to breathe new life into a, uh, a building or a precinct or something that needed that because that had come from sunset and um, but that's not what ended up happening so do you want to talk about the beginning of our adventure uh, and your you know journey with Brisbane over basically five years um, so I think initially um, we we slightly contradictory we I came to Brisbane to see if there was another sunset like space could we could we take the form of sunset could we take some of that text that had been written and find recontextualize it or or find something in Brisbane like that and um Louise was just in uh 
just beginning her time as an artistic director. So we, with, and with Amy, we went running around Brisbane looking at spaces, and it kind of very quickly became evident that the sunset was site specific, and it was really difficult to try and find that. So we began talking about the potential of a new, a new, a new work, a new creation, but that would. I would lead with the vision of that, um, but it would draw on, um, it could, would develop potentially existing relationships that I'd made. So in Sunset, I was my first collaboration with Rachel Deese, an amazing vocalist and composer and sound designer. Um, I feel like I kind of struck gold when I met Rachel in Perth, actually. So this would be, Salamander's actually my third collaboration with her. Um, she's, uh, she's incredible. So I think... Then we began just talking about, well, what else could we do? And we, 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 Tim from the festival took us to this amazing aircraft hangar, so Hangar 7. Um, not in North Shore, where is it exactly? No, it's near the airport. It's an uh, extraordinary site that doesn't really get used, but it's owned by Brisbane City Council. And I think there's vision to turn it into something historic. Uh, but we did fall in love, but enormous, enormous space. And it was, it was a, um, this just would have been my second independent project on site. And I remember walking into the hangar and it was astonishing and just sort of walking out again. I was like, I have no idea what I would do in a big space like this. Find me a little room somewhere. Um, you did do that. I did do that. And then, and then, I, and then it's just funny, isn't it? Like the, the magic of how ideas just start to appear. And um, I started to think, well, how do you fill a big space? And I was like... Maybe if you just put something big in it, you'll fill it. <laughs> um, and so we, we started to dream up an idea for the hangar. Um, and, with Ez, and then Ez Devlin, as a col collaborator, potentially came on board with that, somebody that I really wanted to work with. Um, and then that went away because of, because of COVID and because of the festival and North Shore came on board. Um, and so then... We, we shifted and Louis said, we, the hangar isn't available, but there's some amazing spaces on the North Shore. We've been developing the festival and the community in this area. Um, maybe we could dream up something for the North Shore. And then that's where Salamander began. So um, I remember having a meeting with you because as you said, I hadn't started the festival yet uh, when we when you had this first adventure. And in a way, I've, I'm really grateful to the time of COVID because it allowed lots of things to happen and change and reimagine and all of all of the things that we'll probably talk about in the next festival session. But uh, because of that, my provocation back to Maxine changed significantly. And then of course you had uh, built this relationship with Ez Devlin. And I remember we had a meeting on Zoom. Um, Bella and Min were probably on that too. And she was in New York. And I was a little, you know, starstruck, a bit overwhelmed by having this meeting. And obviously I, by this time I'd gotten over my, um, you know, big crush on Maxine at this point and, and um, just felt like you were my friend. So, uh, but uh, Ez had been watching the Brisbane Festival because she was in lockdown in New York, but she had a connection by looking at the Florentine Hoffman birds that had taken over the city, which was a way of me trying to bring some scale at a time that Obviously, it was all about stay at home. Uh, but that was such an extraordinary thing to see how Brisbane was connecting to the rest of the world and her generosity in that moment. Uh, but then last year, um, there was a, you've done several workshops also with um, ADC uh, along you know, the last few years when you've been able to come, of course. Uh, but Maxine came to Brisbane Festival and it was important that she spent some time with us and got a sense of who our city is, how it is when it's turned on in a Brisbane Festival sense, the art boat, the North Shore, connecting with Amy's company further. But also to see last year was... Um, a, a big Australian program of work and I felt that that was really important for Maxine to see the context of which uh, work was being made in this in Australia uh, and yeah can you talk a bit about how that experience was for you um, seeing so many new Australian works come to life? Um, yeah I had a great time in look, running around the festival but I, I was um you know, I see as much work as I can, depending on my family and if I'm traveling. Um, so this is a really great opportunity to see work. And 
I, I, saw t I, t I saw two works that just that blew me away, actually. Um, so much so that when I went home, I wrote to like, the artist director of Sadler's Wells, and he was, he's not really a friend, actually, but I just wrote to him anyway. Um, I saw Manifesto, Stephanie Lake's um, Manifesto, which I thought was just incredible, um, and Dance North's Wayfinder. Um, and they're probably going to they're probably going to stay there on my kind of list of amazing, uh, inspiring dance works that I've seen. So, um, yeah, it just got me more excited about creating in Brisbane and creating with that sort of caliber of dance artists. And um, I didn't have much time with Amy's company at that point, actually, in the studio. We had, a, we had a few days together at that point, didn't we? But I managed to see Aftermath, which I really enjoyed and and just got to sort of know the dancers because my, my process is, is very collaborative. Um, I have a very clear vision in terms of what I see in my imagination, in terms of space design, light, and an aesthetic with sound. Um, so, and I write down what I imagine um, right at the beginning. I do loads of writing, actually, and then I look at it again at the end of a process and see if I've actually made what I thought in the beginning, what I, what I dreamt. And I often kind of, it's not far off, um, but the language of the pieces, the, the physical language, the movement language, the text, that, that comes from the individuals in the room. Um, and so it was really important for me, with any project that I do actually, um, to have a, some workshop time so I at least get a sense of the personalities and the people. Um, I get a sense of whether I think we can work well together and it's going to be something it's going to be fun <laughs> we're going to be able to enjoy each other we're going to be able to support each other and and make each other better um that's always my drive really is how can we be our best selves in this process and then hopefully in that way we can create something stunning so 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 yeah so hopefully some of you have had an opportunity to see salamander uh but for those that haven't, and even if you have, I think um, having a, a bit of a conversation about Salamander and, and what it is and what it means to you and the journey, and you are incredibly collaborative, uh, which is such a wonderful uh, way to watch you work and how you've embraced all of the artists that we have suggested to you, so ensuring that Brisbane... Designers have been uh, working with you, Ben Hughes, lighting designer, uh, Rosina, Salman, uh, lots and lots of opportunities for locals. But can you talk about Salamander uh, and this uh, epic adventure that um, you have been on and that now is burst into the world? Uh, yeah. <laughs> that, um, is that the look of... No, it's just, I suppose it's just, you know, most of you in this room, all of you, most of you, some of you, you know, you know that feeling of when you've just made, some, made something and it's, it's still like living and breathing and you're close to it. It's kind of, hard. it's hard to talk about it. Um, well, what about talking about the talk journey? About okay. okay. I can talk about it though, but I mean, it's, yeah. <laughs> Let's try to help. Um, so I think, I've, I think, so... Uh, Louise said, I, what, what about something for a big warehouse space? It's not as big as the hangar, but it's a big, em a big empty space on the river. Um, and I'd been working with Es Devlin, and we had already created, for Gothenburg, we made an installation work, but we, we also made a stage work as well. It was a really, really ambitious, challenging, um, challenging project. Um, and one of the installations that we'd made for Gothenburg was this maze. And just in the context of the Gothenburg Here Not Here show, um, it was really underused actually, just because of time. It was just, the audience had five minutes with it and it was a promenade. So different small groups of audience would come, see the maze, see a solo in it, move on to the next installation. Um, like f 500 people in that sort of form, but just five minute interaction. So. All we really made in Gothenburg for that part of the installation were these four solos, which were, which were nice, which were beautiful in and of themselves. But they were, it was just, it was kind of underwhelming, if I'm honest. So, um, and, but Ez had kind of created this stunning maze. So we talked to Gothenburg and we talked to Louise and we talked about, well, why don't, we would love to 
use this maze? So instead of remaking and rebuilding, um, can we repurpose this visual art piece and have this as a sort of centre point? What well, part of the centre point for Salamander? And the, the maze to me, it was, was many things. It was these, the labyrinth of our mind. It looked like a, a kind of an iceberg. It felt like a petri dish or a, a strange specimen jar. It reminded, it, I was taken to the world of science fiction. I was, we'd all been in a world where we'd been communicating through glass, through computers. We'd all been in a world of separation. Um, and increasingly, I don't know if it's just age or something, but I'm increasingly more interested in, all my work seems to come back to this idea of separation and community and what we miss and what we, we're needing. So um, these ideas were kind of swimming around. Um, and, uh, and then as and I were collaborating, as uh, was sharing work with me, Joanna Macy's work, World as Lover and World as Self. Um, and we were talking about this kind of particular moment in time, the climate crisis, this global crisis. Um, but Joanna Macy has a really interesting take on that. Um, and she talks about this, uh, the time of a great turning, this time of great transformation. So um, we talked about this idea of change and community and the power of the community and the power of something that can happen when people come together versus the kind of the myth of the individual or the yeah the the yeah the myth of the individual and how so the work became about that really it became about this individualized society and then this sort of community um a strange dystopic toxic future versus a humanly generated um powerful society that can make changes and i i, I knew that i wanted a a long table for part of the work um I was inspired by a film called Don't Look Up. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio is like the, one of the lead producers and actors in that. But in that, there's a particular scene at the end of the, at end of the film where the key protagonists come together and they sort of have this last dinner together as they kind of wait for the asteroid to destroy the world. Um, it's a political satire. Um, it's about people not looking up, people not seeing. So. This was another sort of source that we were kind of talking about. And then as I said, well, why don't we have this table, but why don't we move it so it can be, it can represent, it can be a clock face, it can represent time. Let's make it red. It's one of Ez's sort of key colors. If you ever look at her Instagram, there's lots of red everywhere. Uh, she talks about that as a sort of call to arms, um, a call to emergency. Um, so we created this big red spinning table and then actually it was really those two sonographies that then dictated really the the physicality and the journey of the work that was to become salamander i also read quite a lot of science fiction i was reading um jg ballard's the ground the drowned world where he talks about a world that is um is un becoming un uninhabitable because of temperatures um and rain and a kind of strange fictional idea that uh, as human beings we're starting to metamorphosize into a kind of amphibian. Um, so I started to mix lots of different fictions and all of these resources and sources and ideas I shared with a company and then the dancers would then send me things and share, send me things to read. Rachel particularly, Rachel Deese, the composer, she, um, we would collaborate every, every morning on a Thursday, uh, London to Perth, um, and things just began to sort of evolve organically like that, so that when I arrived with the company, everybody's brains were kind of strong, you know, people's ideas. And so I was really always interested in, um, you know, the, the, the artists as thinkers and contributors and, um, yeah, uh, people that are gonna challenge, invite you and have a conversation with you and challenge you in that, in that way. And that's really how Salamander kind of began. Um, a big space and two big things in it. Thank you so much. I, every time you talk about it, I feel like I learned something else because every time you watch the show, you can take something else from it. You're extraordinary. I mean, you've really touched on this already, but um, one of the other extraordinary gifts uh, that you bring to your choreographic work is the way you 
you know, I think you can tell a profound story. You're a great storyteller. And I think that's been, you know, certainly talked about in a lot of your the reviews about your work. Um, and that that journey and the kind of connection, emotional connection that you um, find a way to make through your choreo choreographic work and through the dances, of course, but you and the way you, you do that. It's such a generous way of of making art that I think has really resonated, particularly in this work. Um, so perhaps if you're happy to elaborate a little bit more on the way as a choreographer and a maker in terms of that storytelling, because, um, you know, there's probably many choreo choreographers in the room and um, everyone has their different aesthetic and their style, but that's something that's um, quite uh, distinctive in your, in your artistic practice. Um, yeah, I think, I've, I think I've always been interested in expression and emotion. Um, I'm actually very bad at making movement. I can't really, I'm terrible. I, was, I wasn't so bad when I was younger, but I, 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 I don't make very good movement, which is why I engage with the dancers and it's really, you know, the dancers in any work I'm in, they're kind of choreographers in, in their own right. And they, once, once I've got movement language, then I really love it and I'm really, I've got a really curious eye. So I love manipulating it and shifting it. My approach is, is much more directorial. Um, I think I worked, you know, I worked with, I've, I worked with Punch Drunk for 20 years and the first work we made together, Sleep No More, Felix's provocation to me was I want to make um, Macbeth as a film noir thriller in a site. Um, I want to use the soundscape and atmosphere of Bernard Herrmann, um, but I want to do it without any words and I don't know how to do that. So I, I kind of practiced... I was a, with Sleep No More, it was the first time I'd really taken a text. Um, and I really used Shakespeare, actually. I used him, I used the, the ideas and those stories and those narratives to, to work out how to tell those stories physically through movement. So punch drunk work is very linear, even though often audiences say, I can't find this, the narrative, where's the story? I, there's so much story there, you just have to find it. But it's, you know, it's a set up, Sleep No More has... 24 kind of linear narratives happening at the same time. When I was sort of maybe 19 or 20, I saw a, a film by Robert Altman called Shortcuts, which is layered narratives. And I was like, oh, that's ping, that's interesting. And the work of David Lynch had always sort of jumped out at me. Um, stylistically, yes, but also because of these kind of non-logical narratives, but still this sort of narrative drive. Um, so, and then all of the shows that I made with Punch Drunk, the, the mask-based shows, they have these strong stories. So I got, I practiced actually. I just made lots of stories in collabor collaboration with dancers. Um, and then Emma, I don't know if any of you know Emma, Emma Gladstone. She was the artistic director of Dance Umbrella, of, who, of, of which festival I've never kind of worked with. But I did have some mentoring sessions with her. Um, and... One of the things that she said to me, she said, oh, Maxine, but the audience is always in your head and that's not always the way for some artists. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, another epiphany moment. I think, so think for me, I'm always, I'm often, I'm always thinking about the, the audience and what they are seeing. Not that they have to understand it. It's not, it's more poetic than, than linear, but what do the audience see? What do they feel? What do I want to see? What kind of work do I... What work, what work do I love? You know, I, Louis said, I loved, I loved the work of Pina Bausch. I loved um, lots of the CD Lobby work that I've seen. Equally, I love William Forsyth and some of that, you know, more um, abstract but really dense movement language. Um, Peeping Tom, uh, Robert Wilson. So uh, what, what kind of work do I want to see and so that always kind of drives me as well putting stepping outside putting myself in the place of the audience um and and then I, again i just i think this is a shift with with punch drunk work felix has always been driven by innovation you know he wants to um do something different quote unquote plant his flag that's felix's drive and actually if i i 
I actually want to try and make work that feels meaningful to me. Um, and I think uh, maybe this is, again, a product of just maturing, just, um, yeah, wanting to, what do I have to say about the world? What's my response to the world? What's my response to um, where I am today? And then the, the work becomes a kind of manifestation with that in, in dialogue with the artists that I'm working with. Thank you. Um, so you're starting to really talk to us about your independent practice, which um, is, you know, an enormous uh, new journey, but also you've kind of been in, in and out of that world for many, many years. And I, I guess, can I ask, it, does it still feel overwhelming to be an independent artist, given your extraordinary CV and, and the accomplishments that you've had, but to then, you know, post Salamander, you know, coming back to, into Maxine Doyle, independent artist, how does that feel for you? I think, I think every, yeah, I mean, I still wake up thinking, oh, what's the next thing? Oh, Salamander's going to finish. What do I, you know, what, where's the next yeah, where's the next project? Um, yeah, I think it's you're always you're always hustling. I mean, Punch Drunk definitely helped to open doors for me. Um, but prior, you know, my process to get to Punch Drunk was, you know, I, I am an independent artist. I didn't come through a main company. I was never good enough to even, you know, cross the dance studios of those main companies in the beginning. Um, you know, I, I hustled, I learned so much of my practice through workshops. I did every workshop I could. I wrote down everything I could. I have this these journals of my notes that I still go back to from Key, you know, from KJ Holmes, amazing contact improviser, who sort of introduced me to the work of con contact improvisation, which opened up my practice as a mover and as a, as a maker. Um, so I was, I was, all, I was, you know, I'm, I'm so I'm like 50% talent, 50% tenacity. Um, I did, I had a small, tour, small scale touring company in my twenties, but you know, the tour was in my car and I was a stage manager and I, you know, we did eight, 10 or 11 venues. And so I've, 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 I've done it that way. And then when I met Felix actually in Punch Drunk, it, that was a pivotal moment for me because I kind of felt like, okay, I've got, a, I've kind of got a partner now. There's two of us, and and that was, you know, we started to build our team and we can build our tribe and we could, we had more people to try and make those things possible. Um, and then I, so I think I said like around 2015, I I I could see that Punch Drunk it wasn't mine actually. I'd perhaps deceived myself into thinking it was mine, but it kind of it wasn't my company, even though those sleep no more those big works they, they they kind of are but um and I kind of had to start again a little bit and I I had to go knocking on doors and I'm phoning up people I hadn't spoken to in sort of 10 years the Arts Council and Wayne McGregor and people that I, I kind of knew but I hadn't spoken to and started having meetings and conversations again and um kind of yeah just starting to yeah to hustle and to find avenues and possibilities and then I think that took that takes me back actually to the strut story and to taking that opportunity, um, which really probably kicked off this 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 these these events in in Australia. So um, yeah, I do I'm doing lots of work in Australia, but not that much in England. <laughs> Thank you for sharing all of that, Max. Uh, I love listening to you. And um, do we have time for a couple of questions? Yeah. So, who would like to ask a question? We have a microphone roving around. Great, excellent. Uh, well, we've got three hands that went up. Um, thank you so much. Max, I'd love to know how long you spend in the actual creating room. So you've spent years thinking up and dreaming the idea and communicating with everyone. Yeah. But how long did you actually spend to make Salamander once you were in the room? Yeah, so... so I was really ready to go with Salamanda, so as much as I could be, but we had four weeks in February, um, creative development in February, but I think we were really lucky because it was a phenomenal four weeks when every day we, we discovered things, we didn't waste time, but we did play. You know, there's lots of things that we discovered in that four weeks that didn't arrive, but we, we had a really solid um, time together. And then... I came back in July, so that was four weeks, and we had two weeks in the studio to remember um, 
and then to create a bit of the maze world. So that was six weeks. And then we had three weeks on site. Um, but when we were on site, we had the, the, pretty much the space. A lot of the space was there. So we had the structures. Um, so nine weeks. And then we had our tech, which I know for some people sounds like a phenomenal, a lot of time, but it's not that long, if I'm honest. And um, if you go, you know, if you work in Belgium or something, those, some of those, that, that work develops over months and months and months and months. So um, I'm very grateful for the nine weeks and I think we had four days of tech. Yeah. I mean, that could be a whole session on itself, you know, the duration of time and the pressure that our artists have to, particularly if I'm being honest in Australia, to make new work. I think uh, it's something we probably need to have a serious conversation about because... Um, Anyway, we'll leave it at that. Uh, there was a question. Um, thank you. Hi, Max. How are you? Um, I had a question about the uh, performers in, um, in the work. I saw the work last night, and congratulations. Um, you obviously work in dance and work with dancers um, pr predominantly in your performance work, but um, the singer and artist last night, I wanted to ask more questions about her and how that came about and that collaboration. Yeah, so that's Rachel Dees. Um, so I met Rachel in Sunset. I, need, we, it, I was looking for a composer for that work and I wanted, I had an idea for some live music and f just felt like it was an opportunity for original composition and we worked with Tour and New Music who commissioned Rachel. I just was, I just lucked out with Rachel. Like I, you know, I went, she had a play on. I like the sound design for that. I li listened to the music on her website. I thought, oh my God, she's got the most amazing vocals. I had a cup of tea with her. We got on. That was it. She had a baby during sunset. It was all, but she was just brilliant. I just, you know, I was lucky. You know, sometimes you, I think, I think finding your collaborators is really important. I think you, I like, you know, you, you can't collaborate with everybody. And I think, we, had, we identified quite quickly, Rachel and I, that we had similar tastes, but different backgrounds. You know, there was an, enough of us. We could connect as women. We could connect as friends um, or as, human, as people. Um, so we, de we developed that relationship in Sunset. And then we, I was invited to make a work on, Goth on Gothenburg Dance Company, and I wanted Rach to create that with me. So, again, that was a long process, a good, a good 12 months of collaborating across the waters and that was a huge huge project creating fifth of uh, an hour's work for the stage plus a, a series of six installations so so then you get a shorthand with people um and and we can be honest with each other so i you know both rachel and i admit that we can quite easily in our work fall into sentimentality we can fall into melancholy so we have to fight against that a little bit we can be on and we can be honest with each other in terms of those conversations um and i just i thought for this work that for salamander i just really wanted rachel to be really present as a performer as a presence um i, I said i didn't want this this work isn't linear salamander it, it 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 sits in the realm of the poetic but i i didn't want it to be baffling um and there's just something about rachel's narrative the hum the human voice the presence of the singer that just reaches most of us, you know, dance, as we know, can be really excluding sometimes. Um, that's not a bad thing. That's just the way it is. But I wanted to try and make this work have a something that we could all, everyone could grab hold to, to some part of it. Um, yeah, so that, that's Rachel. Thank you. Uh, there was another question. Oh, okay. Yep. And for them, we've got one uh, up the front here as well. So... Uh, hi, Max. I saw Salamander last night, and I'm really interested in uh, that kind of counterpoint between a work being about our dystopian future, about climate change, but also how we produce work as artists that incorporates sustainability, uh, especially with large-scale work. And I'm interested in both your thoughts about where in the next 30 years the role of these festival works and how you create work in this climate crisis. Um, just if you have any comments on that. Yeah, it's, cha it's challenging. I know, um, I know with Ez, Ez's work particularly, she, you know, she has instigated, in the UK particularly, she sort of instigated um, 
within the theatre, within the sort of theatre system, how sets and spaces can be recycled, how materials can be recycled. Um, so when we made the maze originally in Sweden, that was made of recycled uh, polycarbonate. Um, we've shipped it here. We've flown here. Um, yeah, there's a, there's there's a there's a challenge with do we stop travelling as artists? Do we how do how do we make work if we can't be in the same room as people? Um, we just try and reduce our travelling, reduce our, our our sort of footprint. I think Salamander for me was just was a is a response to where we are and less ab about the dystopia of where we might be and just more about as well more about a sort of celebration of what we could be. Um, and that was a challenge in the work, is how, how for it to not be dark and depressing and negative, but how there can be some optimism there. Um, and like when, as would, you know, as would say, like, you know, her work is, she's, she's, an, she's an activist, I'm, she's, she's an activist in her processes and she puts herself out there. And, but her sort of mantra when making work is like, can we try and make, can we try and make something amazing? Or can we try and make something that people feel that reaches them? Um, that might provoke conversation or discussion rather than uh, something that preaches or tells us or we get lost in the data. But there's definitely, and I'm imagining it's conversations that you'll be talking about next, how, how to make festivals sustainable, how we... It, it's a great question uh, and it's a conundrum. <laughs> but um, I would say that this um, did take a long time to make, obviously, because of not just COVID, but it's a work of significant scale. Uh, and it's not something that happens every year. Um, and it's, these are big questions that we need to ask ourselves. How many of them, you know, making sure that it wasn't flying in 50 people, it was flying in two people. It, you know, Australian artists, Australian dancers, um, building our own capacity, a whole range of things that are really critical to our industry, uh, that festivals need to be absolutely supporting. Uh, and uh, But I, I guess I'm really not answering your question, but I suppose what I'm trying to do is uh, offer the the complexity and all of the considerations that come into making a work of this scale, that it can't be wasted on one big ta-da moment and you know this is just let's just show off to the world about flex our muscles there is so much more to this um and i i hope that um that's come across from a brisbane festival point of view but thank you for the question okay there was one more and um that's it then yes Thanks for such an interesting discussion this morning. My question is about the reflections you've given us on audiences and how audiences impact on your work. And you talked about Sunset as an example where it was a new arts audience who came to that show. And you mentioned that it made you feel excited and terrified. So I'm just interested in how audience impacts on your work. Yeah, um, I think I think with, sun, with Sunset, I, I, I don't know that if it was an... A, can't say it was a new arts audience because I would be presuming that, but it was it was more the demographic of the audience in terms of mature age and maturity. Actually, it was the hist it was the history of the building that brought us from ten to ninety or something. I think was our oldest audience, and that that was exciting. Um, I think I think I, I think I've articulated it. I'm not sure, but it's just. You can't make an audience enjoy your work, and I just, I just want to, I just make work that I think I would want to see, and I would want to be moved or engaged by. So, I do think about the audience. Um, in a site work, I think about the sight lines, um, the audience experience. Can they see? Is it comfortable? We, we, you know, we work on things like it sounds quite banal, but what's the entrance like if I'm standing in a queue for 15 minutes and then I have to stand again for another 35 minutes? Is that going to annoy me? Am I going to be uncomfortable? Is it going to? I, we, it's about trying to encompass the, the whole of it, the in and the out. Um, and when I, when I was touring, actually, I had a small scale dance company, and I was like my late twenties, and I was sort of touring quite a, actually a show that I thought was not bad. It was quite good. It was, wasn't a bad show, but I felt um, I thought the, the the venues that we were travelling to, the atmosphere was just dead actually that you, you do this work to get to create a work that you'd be excited by but the the foyer would be stifling the marketing would be stifling 
there'd be three people and a and a cat coming to watch you, <laughs> and and I just I just I that I found that really dissatisfying. So then I started taking my work, not not so innovative. You know, I started like okay, let's do it in a a different space or a bar space, and let's have a DJ at the beginning and a DJ at the end, and try and just create um, an atmosphere. And then I think when I met Punch Drunk, our work is so much about audience and atmosphere. That's what I'm trying to. That's what I'm trying to hold on to. Thank you. Uh, please join me, everybody, in thanking Maxine for uh, this great conversation. And it's um, a real pleasure to hear you talk from such a honest uh, place. And I'm sure there's a lot that people have taken from it. So thank you very much for coming.